The American Civil War fought between 1861 and 1865 has been well documented as the bloodiest conflict in the history of North America. A common explanation is that the Civil War was fought over the moral issue of slavery. Hi there, welcome to yet another momentous one. In this video segment, we go back in time to the infamous era of the American Civil War, events leading to it, and in particular, the involvement of a notable individual, John Caldwell Calhoun, former vice president and senator. But before we continue, only remember to hit that like button in front of you as a way of showing support. Share with your friends and families too, to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative, and kindly subscribe to keep getting notified, whilst you as well join the rising membership of this channel. We are delighted to have you with us. Now back to history, which made us to understand that it was the economics of slavery and political control of that system that was central to the conflict. A key issue was states' rights. The southern states wanted to assert their authority over the federal government so they could abolish federal laws they didn't support, especially laws interfering with the South's right to keep slaves and take them wherever they wished. Another factor was territorial expansion. The South wished to take slavery into the Western territories, while the North was committed to keeping them open to white labor alone. Meanwhile, the newly formed Republican Party, whose members were strongly opposed to the westward expansion of slavery into new states, was gaining prominence. The election of a Republican, Abraham Lincoln, as president in 1860 sealed the deal. His victory, without a single Southern electoral vote, was a clear signal to the Southern states that they had lost all influence. Feeling excluded from the political system, they turned to the only alternative they believed was left to them, secession, a political decision that led directly to war. What many may not take cognizance of were events leading to the Civil War. Events culminating in the Civil War started far back as late 16 and early 17 centuries. Some of the principal parties, such as John Caldwell Calhoun, didn't live to witness the Civil War, but the seeds they planted and nurtured eventually had catastrophic result. As such, the history of that era, popularly called Antebellum Era, cannot be written without mentioning John C. Calhoun, who rose to become one of the most powerful politicians of the time. John, obviously obsessed by the evil of covetousness, to the point of the dim unmindfulness of the harsh reality of slavery and the unspeakable state of existence wherein black slaves were entrapped, had gone to the point of asserting his ethnocentric beliefs in the most intellectual way possible. The shining darkness in his intellectual articulations and barbaric oratories, of course, earned him followers, all of whom were those obsessed as well with the madness of never letting slavery go away. From a speech given in 1838, South Carolina's John C. Calhoun declared that slavery was not a moral evil, as some even in the South, including Thomas Jefferson, had once maintained. He argued that slavery seen in its true light was a blessing to both races, but especially to African Americans a haven from the racial warfare that would otherwise break out and the best and most stable foundation for free society. That was how mentally inclined towards slavery Calhoun was. Already in his own day, many people would have sent Calhoun into oblivion, but others who loathed his commitments nevertheless held his intellect in high regard. John Stuart Mill, who knew no doctrine more damnable than the idea that one kind of human beings are born servants to another kind, considered him a speculative political thinker superior to any who has appeared in American politics since the authors of The Federalist. Herman Melville, who regarded slavery as a sin, foul as the crater pool of hell, took Calhoun as a model for Captain Ahab, a dark and wild genius whose defiance, I'd strike the sun if it insulted me, makes everyone around him seem small. Even some passionate abolitionists predicted that Calhoun's posthumous reputation would be without that element of contempt and loathing, which must mingle with the memory of his northern imitators and tools. Born in the South Carolina backcountry in 1782 and educated in New England, he arrived in the House of Representatives in 1811, where the Virginian John Randolph sized him up as a combination of cold, unfeeling Yankee manner with the bitter and acrimonious irritability of the South. John C. Calhoun, who lived between 1782 and 1850, was born in South Carolina and rose to become the U.S. Vice President to two presidents, John Q. Adams and Andrew Jackson, from 1825 to 1832, when he resigned, making him one of the only two Vice Presidents of the United States to have ever resigned. 
Calhoun, a slave owner himself, was the fourth child of Irish-born Patrick Calhoun and his wife Martha Caldwell. Patrick's father, also named Patrick, joined the waves of Scotch-Irish emigration from County Donegal to southwestern Pennsylvania. After the death of the elder Patrick in 1741, the family moved to Virginia. Following the British defeat at the Battle of the Monongahela in 1755, the family, fearing Indian attacks, moved to South Carolina in 1756. Patrick, a prominent member of the tight-knit Scotch-Irish community on the frontier who worked as surveyor and farmer, was elected to the South Carolina legislature in 1763 and acquired ownership over slave plantations. As a Presbyterian, he stood opposed to the established Anglican planter class based in Charleston. Patrick remained neutral in the American Revolution and opposed ratification of the U.S. Constitution on grounds of states' rights and personal liberties. Calhoun would eventually adopt his father's beliefs on states' rights. As vice president and in other capacities, his stance and support for slavery were remarkably known. However, his most daring influences were as senators and the Secretary of State. Many of his actions have been criticized on several fronts, particularly for his defense of slavery and his support for states' rights. Examples of his actions and positions that have drawn criticism are Calhoun was a staunch defender of slavery and believed it was a positive good rather than a necessary evil. He argued that slavery was a vital institution for the Southern economy and society, and he vehemently opposed any attempts to restrict or abolish it. His defense of slavery perpetuated a system that dehumanized and oppressed millions of African Americans. As two-time senator, Calhoun argued that slavery was a positive good for the enslaved on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Calhoun served in the Senate first between 1832 to 1843, just immediately after his vice presidency, and later from 1845 to 1850. Calhoun led the pro-slavery faction in the Senate, opposing both total abolitionism and attempts such as the Wilmot Proviso to limit the expansion of slavery into the Western territories. Calhoun's father, Patrick Calhoun was a staunch supporter of slavery who taught his son that social standing depended not merely on a commitment to the ideal of popular self-government, but also on the ownership of a substantial number of slaves. Flourishing in a world in which slaveholding was a hallmark of civilization, Calhoun saw little reason to question its morality as an adult. He believed that slavery instilled in white people a code of honor that fostered civic-mindedness. From Calhoun's standpoint, the expansion of slavery decreased the likelihood for social conflict and postponed the decay of when money would become the only measure of self-worth, as he believed had happened in New England. Calhoun was firmly convinced that slavery was the key to the success of the American dream. Calhoun played a significant role in the nullification crisis of the 1830s. The Tariff of 1828 commonly referred to as the Tariff of Abominations, was the central cause of the nullification crisis. This tariff was first proposed by allies of Andrew Jackson's presidential campaign during the election of 1828. The tariff was so unpopular in the South that it generated threats of secession. John C. Calhoun, Andrew Jackson's vice president and a native of South Carolina, proposed the theory of nullification which declared the tariff unconstitutional and therefore unenforceable. He argued that states had the right to nullify federal laws they deemed unconstitutional, particularly in relation to tariffs. This position challenged the supremacy of the federal government and threatened the stability of the Union. This characteristic would eventually lead to the secession of 11 states and the outbreak of civil war in the 1860s. Towards the end of his career, Calhoun became increasingly disenchanted with the Union and took positions that contributed to sectional tensions. He argued that states had the right to secede from the Union as a means to protect their interests, which ultimately fueled the secessionist movement leading up to the American Civil War. Outraged by British impressment of American sailors into the Royal Navy, he banged the drum for war, declaring that the liberty of our sailors and their redemption from slavery were at stake. Twenty years later in the Senate, he denounced a federal import tariff as a punitive tax on Southern planters and a subsidy for Northern manufacturers. 
When President Andrew Jackson proposed a force bill to compel South Carolina to comply, Calhoun replied that a nation united by force is no different from the bond between master and slave, a union of exaction on one side and of unqualified obedience on the other. Like many before him, including slaveholders among the founders, he saw no contradiction between using slavery as a damning metaphor and sustaining it as a defensible practice. Calhoun held deeply racist beliefs and propagated theories of white supremacy. He argued that African Americans were inherently inferior to whites and should be subservient to them. His racist ideology further entrenched racial divisions and contributed to the marginalization and oppression of African Americans. He owned dozens of slaves in Fort Hill, South Carolina, and asserted that slavery, rather than being a necessary evil, was a positive good that benefited both slaves and enslavers. Calhoun's treatment of his own slaves includes an incident in 1831 when his slave Alec ran away when threatened with a severe whipping. Calhoun wrote to his second cousin and brother-in-law, asking him to keep a lookout for Alec, and if he was taken, to have him severely whipped and sent back. In a letter to Alec's captor, Calhoun wrote, I am glad to hear that Alec has been apprehended, and am much obliged to you for paying the expense of apprehending him. He ran away for no other cause, but to avoid a correction for some misconduct, and as I am desirous to prevent a repetition, I wish you to have him lodged in jail for one week, to be fed on bread and water, and to employ someone for me, to give him thirty lashes well laid on, at the end of the time. Calhoun rejected the belief of Southern leaders, such as Henry Clay, that all Americans could agree on the opinion and feeling that slavery was wrong, although they might disagree on the most practicable way to respond to that great wrong. Calhoun's constitutional ideas acted as a viable conservative alternative to northern appeals to democracy, majority rule, and natural rights. Whereas other southern politicians had excused slavery as a necessary evil, in a famous speech on the Senate floor on February 6, 1837, Calhoun asserted that slavery was a positive good. He rooted this claim on three grounds, white supremacy, paternalism, and capitalism. All societies, Calhoun claimed, are ruled by an elite group that enjoys the fruits of the labor of a less exceptional group. Senator William Cabell Rives of Virginia had earlier referred to slavery as an evil that might become a lesser evil in some circumstances. Calhoun believed that conceded too much to the abolitionists. As Secretary of State under President John Tyler from 1844 to 1845, Calhoun supported the annexation of Texas as a means to extend the slave power and help to settle the Oregon boundary dispute with Britain. In his later life, Calhoun became known as the Cast Iron Man for his rigid defense of white Southern beliefs and practices. His concept of republicanism emphasized pro-slavery thought and minority states' rights as embodied by the South. Shortly after delivering his speech against the Compromise of 1850, Calhoun predicted the destruction of the Union over the slavery issue. Speaking to Senator Mason, he said, I fix its probable occurrence within 12 years or three presidential terms. You and others of your age will probably live to see it. I shall not. The mode by which it will be done is not so clear. It may be brought about in a manner that no one now foresees. But the probability is, it will explode in a presidential election, lending credence to insinuations from certain quarters that he may have been involved in other plans or movements unknown to the public resulting in the eventual civil war as he predicted. As well as providing an intellectual justification of slavery, Calhoun played a central role in devising the South's overall political strategy. According to historian Ulrich B. Phillips, his devices were manifold, to suppress agitation, to praise the slave-holding system, to promote white Southern prosperity and expansion, to procure a Western alliance, to frame a fresh plan of government by concurrent majorities, to form a Southern bloc, to warn the North of the dangers of Southern desperation, to appeal for Northern magnanimity as indispensable for the saving of the Union. Calhoun's ideology, among others, was to protect minority rights against majority rule. He called for a concurrent majority by which the minority could block some proposals that it felt infringed on their liberties. To that end, Calhoun supported states' rights and nullification, through which states could declare null and void federal laws that they viewed as unconstitutional. 
He was one of the Great Triumvirate, or the Immortal Trio of Congressional Leaders, along with his colleagues Daniel Webster and Henry Clay. He later died of tuberculosis in 1850. Public and notable opinions and commentaries about Calhoun have been much of misgivings and disdain, both from time past and present commentators, so much so that Andrew Jackson, the seventh U.S. president and first that Calhoun served with, is credited with saying, I have only two regrets. I didn't shoot Henry Clay, and I didn't hang John C. Calhoun. Some historical commentators on social media were even of the opinion that maybe it was because of Calhoun's minority, slavery, and secessionist ideologies that he is not as widely studied as many of his contemporaries from the same antebellum years. Responding to a poser topic, just how awful was John Calhoun? A responder wrote, and I quote, of all the Southern antebellum politicians, John Calhoun was arguably the worst. Many people in the South from time to time expressed doubts about the morality of slavery. Calhoun had no such doubts. To him, slavery was a positive good, an institution mandated by God, and to be a feature of the American landscape forever. His views on nullification, the right to secede and states' rights provided the basis for the secession of the Confederate states. Even Poe, a general knowledge AI, summarizes him as this. John C. Calhoun was a prominent political figure in the 19th century who held strong pro-slavery and states' rights views. He served as vice president, secretary of state, secretary of war, and as a U.S. senator. His political positions and advocacy for slavery and states' rights are widely criticized today. His legacy is complex and controversial, and opinions about him vary. These and many more tend to show the ill reputation for which John Calhoun was known, a slave owner and slavery supporter. On a final note, Calhoun's actions and views were and are still being widely criticized. His legacy remains controversial, especially the harm caused by his defense of slavery and racist beliefs. John C. Calhoun was so much a zealous defender of slavery that his name has lately been stripped from a residential college at Yali, his alma mater, his alma mater, and from a lake in Minnesota named in his honor when he was Secretary of War. His monument in Charleston, a glowering bronze figure in a cloak spread like eagle wings atop an obelisk, has been removed to an undisclosed location, as if in a witness protection program. John C. Calhoun's defense of states' rights and the entrenched system of slavery ultimately proved irreconcilable with the vision of a unified nation. The complex interplay between slavery, states' rights, and his political maneuvering exposed the deep fault lines in the American experiment. This incompatibility fractured the United States, leading to the horrific and costly conflict of the Civil War. The American Civil War wasn't just a fight over states' rights, it was a clash of fundamental values. John Calhoun's vision of a nation where slavery could flourish directly challenged the North's growing belief in equality. This irreconcilable difference became a bloody crucible that forged a new nation, forever marked by the scars of its past. However, by virtue of this video you've just watched, we are urging for a new world where slavery or tyranny would have been permanently erased from the human mind, nor would anything related to oppression ever be remembered, becoming a long-forgotten history. That brings us to the end of this interesting video. And if you learned a thing or two, reach out to us in the comment section below, share your thoughts with us, we are grateful to always pick from them. Don't forget also to support our works by only hitting that like button in front of you. Share with your friends and families to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative, and kindly subscribe to keep getting notified for more. While you stay with us, keep our channel growing. We are delighted to have you always with us. Thank you very much for watching.